His mission was to film an Atlas rocket go through all three stages of powered flight. This particular mission was part of the Nike Zeus objective for the development of an anti-missile missile during the height of the Cold War. All cameras rolled as they heard liftoff from Vandenberg over their radio. Five, four, three, two, one. We were looking down south, uh, southwest, and the missile popped up through the fog. It was just beautiful. And our guys on our M45 tracking mount with 180-inch lenses on it got it. And sure enough, we could see all three stages of powered flight as they burned out and dropped away. And then, of course, to our naked eye, all we saw was a smoke trail going off into subspace. So we whoopied and shouted and heard the film wrap off in the, in the, the, the BU telescope and figured, well, that was our first big deal, we got it. Lieutenant Jacobs then took the cans of film down to Vandenberg to have them developed that night. The following morning, Jacobs was ordered to go immediately to the office of Major Florence J. Mansman, the ranking optical instrumentation officer in charge. I walked into his office and they had a, a screen and a 16 millimeter projector set up. There was a couch. Um, and Major Mansman said, sit down, and there were two guys, as I recall, two guys in gray suits, civilian clothes, which was fairly unusual. Um, and uh, Major Mansman said, watch this, and turned on the film projector. And I watched the screen, and there was the launch from the day or two before at, at, uh, at Big Sur. As the Atlas missile entered the frame, we could see the, the whole third stage, which is which has two uh, rocket nozzles like this and one in the center, a gimbaled one in the center, fill in our frame from 100 and, oh, about 160 miles. That was pretty exciting optics. And then on that telescope, we could see the warhead, the dummy warhead. According to Jacobs, at this stage, the rocket was traveling between 11 and 14,000 miles per hour when a saucer-shaped craft entered the frame. It flew into the frame like this, and it shot a beam of light at the warhead. Now, remember, all this stuff is flying at several thousand miles an hour. So this thing fires a beam of light at the warhead, hits it, fires another beam of light, and then flies out the way it came in. And the warhead tumbles out of, the, out of space. Now, when the lights came on, Major Mansman turned around and looked at me and said, were you guys screwing around up there? And I said, no, sir. And he said, what was that? And I said... It looks to me like we got a UFO. Nearly two decades later, several letters written by Major Florence J. Mansman were obtained. In one dated March 8, 1983, Major Mansman corroborated Lieutenant Jacob's story. In the film, the assumption was at that time extraterrestrial. Details would be sketchy and from memory. The shape was classic disc. The center seemed to be a raised bubble. Now, Major Mansman said to me, after some discussion about it, and, uh, he said, you are never to speak of this again. As far as you're concerned, this never happened. In another letter, Major Mansman describes how two agents took the footage. They did not sign out for all the footage, but took out that part that showed the encounter and returned the rest of the film as a complete package. The one agent stated as he handed me back the film, that leaves you off the hook, but not off any disclosure. Understood? Naturally, my answer was, yes, sir. Major Mansman never saw it again, and as far as I'm concerned, or nobody else ever saw it again, certainly not at Vandenberg. I'm certain that it left Vandenberg and went somewhere else. Another case involving nuclear missiles happened three years later at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana. This site is the largest missile field in the world. We simply were told not to talk about it. We did not talk about it to anyone. As a Strategic Air Command launch controller, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Salas was one of the men responsible for the deployment of nuclear Minuteman missiles. Three, two, one, key turn. <laughs> These missiles were to be launched as a counterattack in the event of nuclear war. 
On March 16, 1967, Lieutenant Colonel Salas was on duty when he was contacted by his topside guard, stating that there was an unidentified object above the missile site. Salas ordered the guard to observe and report back on any further development. Then he called back within a few minutes and was very frightened. I could tell by his voice he was extremely agitated. Um, he said there was an object hovering outside the front gate, a reddish-orange oval-shaped object, and uh, it just hung there quietly. I went and woke up my commander and uh, told him about the two phone calls. Uh, and as I was telling him about the phone calls, our missiles went into no-go condition, one after the other. Well, we lost nearly 20 uh, missiles that morning. After speaking with his commander, Salas again contacted the topside guard. The guard said that uh, the UFO had vanished, basically just took off at high speed. It was no longer there. These uh, missiles are controlled individually. So if, if something did happen within the system, the electrical system, let's say, or the uh, command and control system for one missile, one launch facility, it would not affect the others. And in addition, these missiles are separated by miles. So all these things point to the fact that um, somehow this object was able to uh, disable these missiles. Later that day, Salas was ordered to report to the Air Force Office of Special Investigations for debriefing by two OSI officers. And so after we gave him our little debrief, um, the first thing the AFO OSI guy did is stand up and said, you need to sign these documents not to disclose any of this to anyone ever. And um, we signed, and basically that was it. They, neither one of them asked too many more questions, and we were escorted out. Several recently declassified documents support Solace's claims of UFO sightings near Malmstrom. This preliminary report, dated the 24th of March, 1967, states that between the hours of 2100 and 0400 Mountain Standard Time, numerous reports were received by Malmstrom Air Force Base agencies of UFO sightings in the Great Falls, Montana area. It goes on further to state that reports of a UFO landing near Belt, Montana, were received from several sources, including deputies of Cascade County Sheriff's Office. Another formally classified secret Air Force telex states that the fact that no apparent reason for the loss of 10 missiles can be readily identified is cause for grave concern to this headquarters. In 1993, after Lieutenant Colonel Salas had retired from the Air Force, he tried to gain access to official Air Force records of the incident. In a letter from the Department of the Air Force, he was informed that no UFO report affected national security, making reference to an attached Air Force fact sheet which states, no UFO reported, investigated, and evaluated by the Air Force has ever given any indication of threat to our national security. If uh, 20 nuclear missiles going down at the same time UFOs are sighted, uh, nearly 20, uh, is not a, a national security incident, then I don't know what is. If unidentified flying objects are capable of disabling our most powerful weapon systems, then understandably the military would not want to reveal any information exposing its vulnerability. This is confirmed in a letter from the Department of the U.S. Air Force which states, as regards this subject matter, mere existence or non-existence is currently and properly classified per executive order and exempt from mandatory disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act because it would reveal defense capability or lack thereof. This letter was a response to an inquiry made by electronic system technician Lee Graham. At the time, Mr. Graham worked at Aerojet, a prime contractor to the U.S. Air Force in developing DSP satellites. He asked the Foreign Technology Division if the satellite system he worked on could and had detected UFOs. Perhaps we need some outside universal